Hi, you guys. Um, so, uh, let me see, what do I have to tell you? Uh, next week we have the novelist Ann Packer, uh, who is the author, the author of two books of short stories, one um, Mendocino and other stories, and Swim, Swim Back to Me, and a novel that you've probably heard of called The Dive from Clausen's Pier, and another one called Songs Without Words. Um, and uh, TSR submission period is uh, open through March uh, through May 31st, and you can submit online. Yay! And um, if you have any uh, feelings about reading in the uh, reading series, and you are a graduate student not graduating, this you know you should. We have one space that just opened up, and we don't need to fill it. But if you're somebody who's not sure whether you want to read in public, probably you should do it now because you should get experience because your time will run out. So, yeah. um, so uh, tonight I'm so pleased to uh, be introducing you to Joshua Hankin, who is the author of Swimming Across the Hudson and the no and Matrimony, two wonderful novels. And tonight he is going to be reading from his third novel. This is his first reading from this novel, and um, it's his first real reading from the novel, and it's coming out in June, right? And so we are getting the advance, uh, the advance <coughs> performance. So I'm just so delighted to welcome Joshua Hankin here. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, for having me here. Thank you, Susie, for uh, setting it up, and Mary Ellen for orchestrating it. Um, uh, yeah, I direct the MFA program at Brooklyn College, so I spend a lot of time uh, with graduate students. Um, but I'm on teaching leave this year, so I'm rusty. So it's, it's a treat to, to be here. Um, I think I'll read briefly first from Matrimony, just because that's, that's the book that's out. Um, and I'll just read the, the very, very short uh, first, first scene or so. And then I'll read either one or two sections from, uh, from the new book, The World Without You, which is coming out um, in late June. And then we'll have time for questions. If you like. I don't think that mic is on. Is it okay. Do you hear me? Do you want to come up? Do I want it to this side? No. I'm at, I'll, no. I'll talk louder. It's, it, it's allergy season for me, so if I get teary-eyed, it's... Uh, <laughs> it's not because I move by the sound of my voice. <laughs> um, okay, this is the beginning section of matrimony. It doesn't really need any introduction because um, it's right at the start. Out, out, out. The first words Julian Wainwright ever spoke, according to his father, Richard Wainwright III, graduate of Yale and grand lubricator of the economic machinery, and Julian's mother, Constance Wainwright. Wellesley graduate and descendant of a long family of Pennsylvania Republicans. Julian, the first Wainwright in four generations to be given his own Christian name. Julian's father would have liked another Richard Wainwright, but Julian's mother was a persistent woman, and she believed a child of hers was entitled to his own identity and therefore his own name. And so at 15 months, in a car ride back from Martha's Vineyard, Julian, who until then had not said a word, and had given his parents every reason to think language would come slowly to him, uttered these words in rapid succession, out, 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 not once, not twice, but repeatedly, until the words became a chant, and it was obvious that for reasons all his own, he didn't want to return to New York City to his parents' apartment on Sutton Place. Now, 17 years later, he had gotten his wish. It was 1986, and he was starting his freshman year at Graymont College a small liberal arts school in Northington, Massachusetts, two hours west of Boston. An alternative school, according to the Graymont brochure, on whose cover there appeared a picture of Rousseau sitting next to a cow. <laughs> Henri Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the students didn't know and they didn't seem to care. <laughs> the only thing that mattered was, they, was that they were at Graymont, in the middle of whose campus stood a shanty protesting college investment in South Africa, a shanty so large it could fit practically the whole student body inside it. According to one upper-class math major, 
more nights per capita had been spent sleeping inside the shanty at Greymont than in any other college shanty in the United States. At Greymont, if you wanted, you could receive comments from your professors instead of grades, and on the application for admission, there was a creative expression section that, according to rumor, one successful applicant had completed by baking a chocolate cake. Hash brownies, the student said, the guy got the dean of admissions stoned. Julian's own creative expression section took the form of a short story he'd written. At 13, he'd met his hero, John Cheever, standing on the steps of the 92nd Street Y, and ever since then, ever since he'd gotten John Cheever's autograph, Julian had known he was going to be a writer. But that would come later, once classes had begun. Right now, Julian waited in his dorm room to greet his new roommate, a young man from New Jersey who had assured him over the telephone that he was bringing the largest stereo system Julian had ever seen. It was going to take the two of them to carry it up the stairs. Julian's roommate was right. The promised stereo system when it was delivered looked like an intercontinental ballistic missile. <laughs> it was a stereo system paid for by Ronald Reagan and built by the United States Pentagon <laughs> and directed at Mikhail Gorbachev and the Soviet Politburo, a stereo system that could blow the Russians out of the sky and turn them into a mushroom cloud. Wandering about the room, trailing wire behind him, Julian's roommate was contemplating where to put his electric guitar, his boombox, his microwave, his toaster oven. He was, Julian thought, a tangle of electricity. This school is wild, his roommate said. Some of the guys on campus wear skirts. They do? They're hoping to transcend the, ba the boundaries of gender. Mostly they're just trying to get laid. There are naked parties here. People come to them without any clothes on. Completely nude? In the winter, I guess, they wear shoes and socks. It gets pretty cold here. <laughs> Julian's roommate was dark-haired and thick-set, and he had brought with him piles of press shirts and trousers, each of them separated from the others by a white piece of tissue paper, as if they had come directly from the dry cleaner. He was hanging them up now, smoothing them out with his hand. You think those guys pee in the shower? Which guys, Julian said. Jared and Hartley, Bill, Stefan. Julian's roommate gestured to the room down the hall. Hartley's the kind of guy who pees in the shower. In the bathroom now, Julian glanced warily at the showers. There were two stalls for six guys, each with a white piece of plastic hanging down from the rod, but not quite reaching the floor. It's bad enough to pee in your own shower, his roommate said, but in a communal shower? He looked up at Julian. You don't pee in the shower, do you? <laughs> no, Julian said. From time to time he had, didn't everyone? I had this roommate in prep school who peed in the sick. You didn't, Julian said. Swear to God, when I was using the bathroom and he needed to go, he'd just climb up on the sink and pee in it. <laughs> That's disgusting, Julian said. All the same, I think I'll be wearing flip-flops in here. Again, his roommate gestured to the room down the hall as if to reassure Julian it wasn't him he mistrusted. Here come the PCCers, his roommate said. Through the window, Julian could see a group of students walking across the quad. They wore blue badges and name tags and held red and black satchels. They were upperclassmen, Julian's roommate said, recent graduates of a week-long training course in reproductive health, purveyors of information about pregnancy and sexually transmitted disease, and in their satchels they carried the tools of their trade, leaflets, condoms, dental dams, and spermicide in all flavors. Julian said, the PCCers? Peer contraceptive counseling, his roommate said. First night at school, they come talk to you. It's all part of in loco parentis. There are dozens of them, like flies, his roommate said. That night, as his roommate had predicted, everyone in Julian's entryway met with four members of peer contraceptive counseling, each wearing a PCC badge and name tag and holding a red and black PCC satchel. In freshman entryways across campus, upperclassmen had descended wearing these very same badges and name tags and carrying these very same satchels. Julian listened to a beautiful young woman named Nicole demonstrate how to use a dental dam. What exactly was a dental dam and why was Nicole wearing one? She appeared to be covered in saran wrap. Now Nicole's colleagues, Brian, Ted, and Simone, were trying on dental dams as well. Several of the boys began to laugh, but the girls nodded knowingly as if they'd spent their whole lives in the company of dental dams. <laughs> Soon it was time to taste the spermicide. There's nothing to be afraid of, Nicole said, uncapping a tube of spermicide and squeezing a little onto her finger. 
She stuck her finger into her mouth, then passed the spermicide to Ted, who stuck his finger into his mouth. Everyone was eating spermicide. <laughs> it's fruit flavor, Nicole told the freshman. It's supposed to be eaten. She asked for volunteers from the students, and when no one raised a hand, she chose Julian. Julian stood up. Was he supposed to stand up? Did you eat spermicide sitting down or standing up? <laughs> Nicole was only a junior, but she seemed so much older than he was, so wise to the ways of the body, to the various flavors of spermicide, and to the reasons there should be various flavors of spermicide. <laughs> Would you like passion fruit, Nicole said, Nicole asked, or strawberry? Strawberry is good, Julian said. Nicole handed him the spermicide. Don't worry, Nicole said, it goes down smooth. It tastes like strawberry bubble gum. Julian squeezed some spermicide onto his finger and stuck it into his mouth. How does it taste? It tasted terrible. <laughs> like strawberry bubble gum, but with extra chemicals. It had a sloppy, grainy texture. Julian nodded in approval. The session lasted an hour and a half, and at the end of it, all 18 freshmen from Julian's entryway were sent off with a contraceptive loot bag that included spermicide, dental dams, and condoms, miniature red and black satchels of their own, taken from the larger satchels that PC Sears carried with them. Carefully, seriously, respectfully, the girls took their satchels upstairs to their rooms while the boys tossed the contents at one another and dissected them. And Hartley from across the hall filled his condoms with water and jettisoned them out the window into the courtyard, seeing if he could get them to explode. Julian's roommate said, I'm telling you, that guy pees in the shower. Could be, Julian said. He went into his bedroom to unpack. Okay, that's, that's just the beginning of the book, and it, it's, um, it actually, it's, a sli it's a slightly misleading beginning in the sense that it's not, uh, it's not all spermicide uh, <laughs> and dental dam. It's just, you know, the beginning of freshman year, and that's what happens, or what happened. Um, and the book covers uh, essentially 20 years, and um, it chronicles the relationship between Julian and his eventual girlfriend, eventual wife, Mia, and the various travails they endure over the course of those, those next 20 years. So um, I always think that you know, when you finish a book that you're, I mean, a book is never finished. And I think like a lot of writers, I, I'm always tempted to make corrections even on published work. I mean, any writer worth his or her salt uh, is really a compulsive yeah. advisor. And I've seen, I've seen writers you know, make changes in published text. I have a friend, a writer friend, who said to her editor, just because you published a book doesn't mean I can't keep making changes. And that's kind of, kind of what I feel. And I think the way you know that you're at the end of a book, because no book is ever perfect, but I think the way you know you're at the end of the book is when you are so sick of it that you can't <laughs> look at it again. Um, and that's sort of a weird thing about you know, giving readings and going on a book tour is that at the very moment that you are most sick of the book, that's the moment <laughs> when everyone is it's fresh for other people and you're supposed to pretend that it's fresh for you too. <laughs> so it's, it's hard. Um, but this is all by way of saying that I think most books are rebound books in the way that a lot of relationships are rebound relationships. And so, at least for me, I always want the new book to be in some fundamental way really different. And one of the real struggles for me with matrimony um, and why it took 10 years to write is I was struggling with the question of how do you write a book that takes place over 20 years um, that doesn't feel like a boring chronology. This, then this, then this, then this. And um, probably year seven when I thought I was gonna have to give up on the book, I reread with Richard Russo's Empire Falls, which is a book I like a lot. It's a very different book from Magic Money, but it's, um, it's a book that I think deals very interestingly with time. He's very good at skipping time and figuring out what to fault in a flashback, et cetera. So the, the, the real challenge of Magic Money was how do you write about 20 years? And I wanted a different kind of challenge with my new book, The World Without You. Uh, and the new book takes place over three days. Um, so it's, you know, the last book was very expanded time and only only two points of view. This is compressed time, um, but it's told in seven or eight points of view. Um, and so the book is sort of both more compact and more sprawling, just in different kinds of ways. Um, and so uh, well, I think the challenge, since you all are writers, and this is something that I hope you think about. Um, I mean, you know, the, the challenge of a 20-year book is what to include. The challenge of, well, actually, the challenge of a of a 20-year book is what to exclude. And the challenge of a three-day book is what to include. I understand that those questions are really flip side of the same thing. But the most obvious thing is that, you know, um, how do you fold in flashback in a three-day three book 
without losing the forward momentum of the story? And how do you make, ha make enough important things happen in three days without making it seem contrived? It's a very different challenges. Um, and we can talk about those challenges. I'm mean, happy to. I have to. I'm just going to read a section from this book. So let me just tell you a little bit about the book, because the, the section I am going to read from is a section that's pretty much entirely in flashback. Um, but let me give you a sort of little uh, snapshot summary um, of the book as best as I can. You know, Jonathan Franzen talks about how the you know the easier it is to summarize a book, the worse the book is, and I, I tend to agree. So I, I'm, of, I'm of the opinion that it's a very hard book to summarize. Um, but um, I'll do my best. Uh, it takes place over a July 4th holiday, three days. Um, three adult sisters and their power <coughs> partners return to the, f and they're in their mid to late 30s, return to the family's country house in the Berkshires in Lenox, the occasion for which is the first anniversary of the brother's death. He was a journalist killed in Iraq. And um, when he died, left a wife and a three-year-old, a two-year-old, a year later, the kid's now three, the wife has since um, gone to graduate school in Berkeley, so she comes back with the kid. Um, and there are certain things that are happening at the beginning of the book. Uh, I, don't, I won't really be ruining too much for you because it's the very beginning of the book, but at the beginning of the book, the parents are, are about to separate. Uh, basically, the grief has been too much for their marriage. Uh, but they haven't told the kids yet. They're planning to tell them once they're up in the Berkshires. Um, so the vast, vast majority of the book takes place in the Berkshire itself, but the first first you know, 50 or so pages take place from the perspectives of different sisters as they're arriving. One sister, Clarissa, the oldest one, lives with her husband Nathaniel in Brooklyn in Park Slope, and she's 39 and they're having trouble conceiving. Um, Lily, the second sister, lives in Washington, D.C. with her boyfriend. She comes up alone without the boyfriend. Uh, Noel, the youngest sister, who was in trouble in a kind of sex, drugs, and school expulsions sort of way as a kid, uh, at age 25, found herself kind of randomly in Jerusalem. Uh, she was on a round-the-world trip. She lands in Jerusalem. She ends up being taken under the wing of an Orthodox rabbi, and she has become Orthodox, and she has met another sort of secular Jew. The family is Jewish, but secular. Um, she's met another secular American Jew, become Orthodox, and they live in Jerusalem, and they have four sons, ages eight, six, four and three. They all come to the reunion too. So the section I'm going to read from takes place on the plane from Tel Aviv to Boston, although you, you wouldn't know it, because the section I'm going to read from is basically entirely in flashback about Noel's childhood. Um, so it's one way to think about sort of how you do, how you do flashback. Um, and I have to skip around a little bit. Um, and it's Clarissa is the oldest sister, Lily is the middle sister, Noelle is the, young, the youngest sister who I'm uh, going to read, whose perspective I'm going to read from. Um, Leo is the brother who died. Okay, I'm going to find it. Okay, okay so we, we're going to jump right into flashback. It wasn't like that for Noelle growing up, feeling like she was better than her parents, especially in anything having to do with school. She would daydream all semester in math, then rely on her mother to help her before the exam, but they would always end up fighting with Noelle in tears. Even now, Noelle remembers math, remembers all of high school, really, as a word problem, with water pouring into the bathtub at one rate per minute and being drained simultaneously at another rate per minute and she had to figure out how long it took to fill the tub. These problems seemed designed to assail her. Why couldn't someone just put in the plug and the bath would fill up as baths normally did? Angry at her mother, abandoning her math homework to smoke a cigarette, Noelle would say to her mother as she was leaving for the hospital, fine, you want me to fail my math test? Her mother, a physician, was a rabid anti-smoker. Anti there was nothing Noelle could do they would infuriate her mother the way smoking did. Nothing until Noel became orthodox and moved to Israel. Believe me, her mother would say, I'd rather, be, I'd rather be home than going into the hospital at three in the morning. Rather be helping me? Yes, sweetie, I would. Always the sweetie to taunt her when Noel understood even then that it wasn't a taunt. 
She still listens for that word which she calls home from Jerusalem. It returns her to infancy. She's nothing but clay in her mother's hands. Take me back, she wants to say. Make me whole again. <coughs> she wants to crawl inside her mother to return to some vestigial tadpole state. Coming home from the hospital, her mother would find her asleep, curled into herself like dough, and she would wake her gently to study again because Noel demanded that she wake her, although her mother insisted those extra few hours wouldn't make a difference and what she needed most was sleep. No one, Noel thinks, not Amram, Amram is her husband, not Amram, not her children, not her sisters, not Leo when he was alive. No one has ever woken her as gently as her mother did, the act of waking her as if an apology. It's like the dream everyone has. You realize you've forgotten to go to class all semester, and tomorrow is the final introductory Chinese. But for Noel, it's not just a dream. It's her life. She is, in fact, enrolled in introductory Chinese. She is, in fact, naked in school, always about to be discovered, because there's something at, at the core transparent about her. The organs, the arteries and veins carrying the blood to and from her heart, just a body spread out for all to see. Red-headed Noel with the blue, blue eyes, 14 years old, and the prettiest girl in Mamaroneck High School. It's where her family moved to Westchester when Noel was 13, because she'd gotten expelled from two schools in Manhattan, and her parents thought if they removed her from the city, that might keep her out of trouble. That, more than anything, Noel thinks, is why Lily can't stand her. Lily never forgave her for banishing the family to the suburbs, for making her leave her friends and start over in a new school. Well, blame their parents, Noel thinks. She didn't want to leave the city any more than Lily did. Look at her, they would say. The boys on the football team and the swim team, Noel's own teammates. The boys who tried out for the swim team just to see her in a bathing suit. Why don't you wear a bikini, Noel? Thinking about her at night in their beds, beneath the sheets they soiled, not washing them, not wanting their mothers to wash them, not wanting to wash Noel out of them. You're killing me, Noel. Just thinking about you makes me come. Noel lived for their voices, feeling she was nothing when the boys didn't talk about her, that she didn't exist at all. Noel the nympho, the girl who couldn't say no. When her mother was on call, Noel, who promised her she'd be studying, was instead out with Campbell, the next door neighbor's boy, or Bruce Weinstein from around the block. She knew who was awake and who wasn't, whose parents were out, could feel her way around the streets near her home, moving stealthily through the bushes, avoiding the occasional passing headlights, following her own internal compass. In the basement and attics, behind locked bedroom doors, lovely Noelle, her hair sliding across her face, the almost soundless sound of it, like the almost soundless sound of Noelle's panties dropping to the floor. Man, that girl's efficient, Casey Hopkins would say. Casey, whose father was a doctor at the same hospital as Noelle's mother, and sometimes, Hearing a parent come home late at night, the sound of others stirring in the house, Noel would escape out the window. How about we go rock climbing, Noel says. This to Mark Hathaway, Noel guiding Mark's hand beneath her shirt. Mark, only 13, a year younger than she is. Noel's heart goes out to the boys like this, the timid ones, like birds, the peach fuzz on Mark's cheeks, the two of them in the audiovisual room, where Mark spends most of his time because he's vice chair of the AV squad, shining the strobe lights on the students during the produc productions of Guys and Dolls in Our Town. Noelle runs her hands across Mark's body, the smooth hairlessness of him, thinking of her mother back in medical school, sticking her hands inside a cadaver. Mark is used to shining the lights on others, only now, with Noelle, the lights are on him, and he wants them off. He doesn't believe in kissing a girl with the lights on. But Noelle wants to see him. She won't do anything with Mark unless she can watch what they're doing. How about we go spelunking, Noelle says. And she guides Mark's hand down the inside of her jeans, under the waistband of her panties. And it's true what the boys say about her. Noelle, just thinking about you makes me come. Because Noelle can see it on Mark's face. The mere anticipation has caused him to ejaculate. And as if Mark has forgotten his cue, and everyone on stage is looking up at him. And Mark, humiliated, runs out, leaving Noelle alone, and now Mark has told the rest of the school what Noelle said, how about we go spelunking? Soon everyone is saying it, 
the boys chanting in Mr. Hampton's English class and along West Boston Post Road, waiting for their parents to retrieve them from band practice. They say it on the way home from synagogue and church, seeing Noelle in a white bikini in front of her parents' house, sunning herself on a lawn chair, placing a halo of tinfoil around her neck so the sun will reflect off it to give her a better tan, her red hair settling in the crevice between her breasts. Hey, Noelle, how about we go spelunking? And Noelle just laughs. She does it everywhere with these boys, even in her parents' house, in her bedroom when they're asleep, and once in her parents' bed when they were out, with a boy named Stanley who said, doesn't it creep you out doing it in your parents' bed? But Noelle simply shrugged. Noelle's enterprising, the boys say. She makes do with what she can. She's had sex standing in the school elevator, having learned how to stop the elevator between floors, elevators having always been her thing. One Halloween, when her family still lived in Manhattan, she told Rudolph the elevator man he could go home for the night, and she, at 12, took over for him, offering the tenants candy and other trick-or-treats as she took them up to their apartment. Her parents moved to Westchester to keep her out of trouble, but there's plenty of trouble to be found in Westchester. Noelle caught with a construction worker, Jimmy, 23, blonde and handsome, with that tool belt dangling from his slim waist, and frankly, Noelle is tired of high school boys. Noelle who feels in that instant when a guy is about to come, in that moment of rapture that crosses his face, that everything's okay and somebody loves her. She stands in the glaring light, knock-kneed as a foal, saying through the, simp the simple stance, the fragile pose, here I am, do what you want with me. Noelle the slattern, lubricious Noelle, licentious, lascivious, wanton, slut. Noelle knows these words, having taken Miss Pickens' vocabulary building class, the boys in the hallway staring up at her from their baron's books as she walks insouciantly by. Noelle doing her best to study for the SAT, the way her sisters are doing, Clarissa and Lily off to Yale and Princeton while Noelle is going nowhere. Nowhere Noelle is as she thinks of herself, up in her bedroom, crying alone. But then she reminds herself that no one is calling out her sister's names at night, and no one is staying up late, with, late to help them with their math homework the way her mother is doing with her. But her mother loses patience with her. It's hard for her to understand how school doesn't come easily to Noelle. Her mother graduated number one in her class from the University of Pennsylvania, and then again from NYU Medical School. Like Clarissa and Lily, she has never failed at anything in her life. In that case, Noelle says, why don't you take my test for me? I can't, sweetie. But in that can't, Noelle hears, I would if I could, and she hates her mother for having no faith in her. Go ahead, she says, tell me you hate me. How could you even think that? You wish I'd never been born. Then Noelle starts to cry, and she says, why do I fuck everything up? Because there's something about her, she thinks, that's at core unknowable, unlovable. Even now, looking back, she wonders what her parents could have done differently. They tried counselors and therapists. They sent her a summer camp for troubled youth. They punished her, they bribed her, but nothing worked. She was 25 when she arrived in Israel. It was random that she landed there, another stop and around the world plane ticket. She figured she'd work on a kibbutz, wake up at four in the morning to pick melons, then sleep away the afternoons with the other volunteers. She'd fall in love with an Israeli Air Force pilot, get up in the morning and put on his uniform, and march like a soldier through the streets. Judaism, Lily likes to say, just another installment in the random life of Noel Glucksman. Lily was the one who wasn't surprised when they learned, after months of not hearing from her, that Noel at 26 had become an Orthodox Jew, living in Israel, engaged to Amram. Hey, Noel, what are you, deaf? This when Noel was a mere six and Lily seven, and sometimes Lily would shout, and Noel seemed not to hear her. Noel ten and Lily eleven, Lily singing the who to her, changing the words to teenage spaceman. In the morning when the alarm went off, Noel slept right through it, and there Lily was again, coming out of the shower, screaming, "Would you turn off the fucking alarm, Noel?" It turned out Noel did have a hearing problem, discovered when she was a freshman in high school. And maybe that was why she was doing so badly in school. She couldn't hear what the teacher was saying. There had been hints of this earlier. Noelle at seven saying to her mother, why if people have two ears, do they only hear out of one? What are you talking about, her mother said. But Noelle insisted she was only joking. At 14, when she went to the audiologist and discovered she had moderate hearing loss in her right ear 
and a little in her left ear too. Noelle began to blame everything on her hearing loss. She had a slight lisp, which she always attributed to an overbite. But now, sitting in the ENT's office going over the results of her test, she became convinced, convinced that her lisp was because she couldn't hear well. She was listening to the doctor even as she wasn't listening to him, turning him off as she'd learned to do. And when he asked her if she'd be willing to wear a hearing aid, she said, sure, even as she was thinking, no way I'm wearing a hearing aid. Hearing aids are for old people. Later at home, she overheard Clarissa and Lily talking about her. Now are you proud of yourself, Clarissa said, saying, what are you, deaf? She's hard of hearing. Oh, come on, Clarissa, Lily said. She's faking it. How, Noel wondered, did Lily know? Although she wasn't faking it, her hearing loss wasn't as great as the doctor believed, because when the audiologist tested her, she intentionally got some of the answers wrong. It was the same way with school. She wasn't an A student and would never be one. But if she tried harder, she could have gotten Bs. But who wanted Bs? You got Bs and no one noticed you. She would get Cs and Ds. She'd flunk out. She'd get left back. Home from the audiologist, she asked her parents to enroll, enroll her in a sign language course. At first, they refused, saying she needed to focus on high school. But then they struck a deal with her that if she did better in her classes, they'd let her take sign language. And for a time, her grades improved. Once she saw a group of deaf teenagers on her subway car, and though her signing had gotten better, she still had trouble following them. She watched them, glanced away, then watched them again until finally one of them shouted, stop staring at us, her voice as high-pitched as a hyena's. She went to a party sponsored by the New York Association for the Deaf, but not knowing anyone, she stood in the corner sipping a beer, feeling excluded and alone. She would use sex, she thought. She'd make a pass at someone. But she found herself, a hearing person among the deaf, unusually self-conscious in front of the guys. And when she tried to approach one, she was convinced all the girls were staring at her, accusing her of trying to steal one of their own, when all she wanted was to talk to somebody. Then the dance music came on. Everyone danced by feeling the vibrations beneath their feet. But it was so loud, she couldn't tolerate it, and she had to go out onto the balcony. Standing next to the chips and the keg of beer, watching everyone gesture to each other, the beautiful choreography of sign language, she resolved to go back inside and dance, thinking if she exposed her ears to the noise, maybe she would really become deaf. At home, she tried to facilitate the process. She practiced backflips on her bed, treating the mattress as a trampoline, and she began to do this with Q-tips in her ears, hoping to block out the world of sound, but also thinking, what if she slipped and landed on her side, plunging the Q-tip into her ear. She learned about someone who'd gone deaf at age 12 and could read lips so well, you couldn't tell she was deaf. She was a graduate student at Columbia and taught a section of introductory European history. She could even talk on the telephone. She would be on one receiver and her roommate would be on the other, reporting what the person said. And when she spoke, there was no lag time. Nicole tracked her down, pretending she was a student studying for her midterm until Revealing she didn't know anything about European history, she heard the woman ask who she was, and she panicked and hung up. For days after that, she felt disgusted by herself. She was always impersonating people, her sisters, her mother, the girls at school, only in a boy's arms. That was the one time she felt she belonged, huddled like a duck in the AV room, attending to him, the look on his face, the grimace, the oh Noel, oh God, the feeling that they'd melded, but then he would roll off her and she'd be alone again, a lump of shame. And his gaze was slack and distant, his eyes like sea glass. And she swore she would never do it again, never have sex with another boy. But then the next one came along and she convinced herself this one would be different. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. particular way that you use dialogue uh, and it, what, what does that mean? well it just it, it <laughs> seems it seems it seems as if you you do what you 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 imply a lot of I mean you you talk about people talking I mean you have you have people saying what they said but not talking right. and you're very particular in the in the actual choices of what is quote unquote spoken dialogue as opposed to forward motion well, summarize dialogue, summarize dialogue. 
Yeah, yeah. And yeah. How, do you think about that in a, in some? Yeah. Way well, planned out? yeah. That's, that's a great. That's a great question. Um, unfortunately, I think about everything. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I, 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 I mean, this will be a long way to answer, but I came to. People hear me without the, at the mic. Um, <coughs> I love to teach. In part because it's social, and I'm a relatively social person, and writing is so solitary. But also because I, I came to writing as a critic. I don't mean as a professional critic, but um, I have writer friends who wouldn't begin to know how to teach uh, for a lot of reasons, but in part because I think they're more naturally intuitive writers than I am. I had to teach myself to become a more intuitive writer. Um, and that sounds like a contradiction to teach yourself to be an intuitive writer, but I, mean, I th think it's true. I mean, Dana Foster Wallace, who um, was once a very serious amateur tennis player, you know, wrote an article about Roger Federer where he talked about this, about sort of the idea of learned intuition. And that, you know, you practice it enough times and it becomes intuitive. And I think for me, you know, I, I have friends who don't want to think about it because they worry if they think about it that I get screwed up. But I'm not that way. I need to think about it in order to not think about it. Um, and so I was, I had a knack for figuring out what wasn't working on in other people's stories. And I wasn't able initially when I first started to write to translate it into my own work. So all that's by way of saying that in general I do think about all the all these things and I feel like my teaching is very related to my writing. In terms of specifics of dialogue versus summarized dialogue, um, I guess what I'd say is this. I think that, um, and I see this in my graduate students a lot, I think that most bad dialogue is simply good dialogue encased in too much connective tissue. That, you know, good dialogue is really, I always say it's like bowling. Are, we any, are there any bowlers in the room? <laughs> bowlers? Does anyone know how to get a strike? And don't, don't tell me you get all 10, ten pins down. Do you, where do you put the ball? Does anyone know that? Yeah, you actually know more about bowling than I do because you're talking about pin numbers, but I get it. You, get, you know, if you hit it right on the, on the center pin, you get a split. You have to put it in the pocket, which is between two pins, the one and three, I guess. Um, so, and I think a, a good dialogue is being like that. You know, Charles Baxter, I think, is very good. Laurie Moore, I mean, people are writing really strong dialogue. I think, I think of Laurie Moore's stories, you know, I think of some of the stories in Like Life, like, uh, like Your Ugly Two or The Jewish Hunter, where characters are talking past each other just slightly, you know. And um, it's like a, there was a Saturday Night Live skit, I'm dating myself, but, you know, in the late 70s, when I was a teenager. It's called Mr. Slow Reaction Man, and you know, as with most Saturday Night Live skits, there it is, all in that, all in that summary. But you know, someone says something that they, you wait ten minutes to get, get a response. But I do think that good dialogue is like that. People are talking talking past each other. Someone says something, and you respond to to, to one of those things, but not to the other thing. I mean, what we don't say is that, what I'm saying is that what, what we leave out is as important, sometimes more important than what we leave in. And what gets unsaid is very. I think. I mean, the only reason to write dialogue is to reveal character. It's not for furthering the plot. You, if you need to further the plot, which you obviously have to do, then occasionally you say, oh, she walked to the car, you know? Um, but you don't have a character saying, where are you going? To the car, okay, I'll meet you there, I'll get in the key, and that doesn't tell you anything about the character. So, I think, I don't know how many sports, sports fans, we've got a bowling fan here, but I don't know how many sports fans there are among you, but I am a sports fan, even though I'm not a bowler. Um, and I think of, Dialogue is, is to actual conversation as um, ESPN Sports Center is to the actual game. In other words, it's the highlights of the, of the of conversation. And so I think, in general, that most bad dialogue that I see is not really bad dialogue. It just needs, it feels too much like an interview with Connie Chung. It needs to, in general, I think. I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I sometimes write reviews or essays, and I'll have an editor say you have to cut 20% of the words. And I think if you, if you take your stories, cut 20% of the words, I can guarantee you they'll be better. It's, there's just so much excess there, and so I think it's particularly true of dialogue, but it's true in general. Now, in terms of the issue of summarized dialogue versus actual dialogue, I think that, um, well, I think in fiction, like life, I and mean, variety is the spice of life, and I think it's the, it's the spice of fiction. And so, what I mean by that is that you know, it's, you just need a breather. I mean, it's very hard to read a scene that is just like three pages of a straight dialogue, and it feels like you're reading a screenplay. And and fiction is not a screenplay. Excuse me. And I think that, well, I think Tim O'Brien is the real. If you look at, at 
the story or the whole book, the things they carried. To me, he's the real master of, of varying this, the cadences of his sentences. You know? I, mean, I once had an undergraduate, Sarah Lawrence, years ago, who said to me, Josh, I, you know, I, I write poetically. And it was true, unfortunately. I mean, I, not that I have anything against poetry, but no fiction writer should ever say, I, I write poetically. I mean, you write poet poetically when poetry is called for, and you don't write poetically when, when poetry is not called for. And that's the difference between fiction and poetry, is that poetry is language for language's sake. And fiction, at least the kind of fiction that I write, is language is extremely important because it's all you have. But it's not about writing a beautiful sentence for its own sake. And you can sometimes write a beautiful sentence and screw up what you're doing. And Michael Cunningham, who ran Brooklyn's College, uh, Brooklyn, Brooklyn's program before me, always says that you know when he was in graduate school at Iowa, he had a teacher said to him, and Michael is someone who admit, he admits is in love with a beautiful sentence. And he thinks, he loves beautiful sentences, but he thinks that that's, he loves them sometimes to a fault. And as an illustration of this, he had a, a teacher in Iowa say to him, okay, Michael, I want you to take your story and I want you to circle all what you think are the A sentences. And the A sentences are the sentences that you just are, think, think are gems, they're beautiful, you cannot part with them. <laughs> and then you know, I want you to circle all your sentences that are B sentences, which are you know perfectly well written sentences, but they're not the gems. So they take all your A sentences, take all your B sentences, and I want you to eliminate all your A sentences. And Michael thought that was very good advice. And Michael is someone who, who cares very much about a beautiful sentence. So all of which is to say that I think that the words you choose, your everything down to your last comma, you know the cadences are all trying to convey something about a feeling, about a character, trying to tell a story. And so you do not, you can bore the reader by having too many great sentences. I mean, well, yeah, just like life. I mean, if every day, I mean, I'm talking to people in the Hamptons, but if, if you're in the Hamptons every day, well, you're in the Hamptons. You, know? you got to appreciate the Hamptons. You got to be able to drive for three hours from New York City. And then you appreciate the Hamptons when you get here. So, so that's true in general in fiction. I think it's particularly true of dialogue, where a lot of what you're doing, there are many ways to, to have variety in fiction. One, I mean, you talk about sort of dialogue versus summary, and you know, your your sentences, the cadences, etc. The, the, the sound of the words. You know, Francine Prost talks about how she chooses the word with the right sound over the word with the right meaning, and I certainly agree with given that choice. Um, but I also think that you know, summarized dialogue versus actual dialogue. The shifting, the slight shifting in vantage point, how close we are to a character. I mean, I spend, I'm just such a compulsive revisor. I spend so much time changing, you know, pronouns back, back to proper pronouns, back to proper. I mean, is, is it Noel or is it she? And it's not, I mean, obviously it needs to be Noel if you don't know who Noel is. But there are plenty of times when you know exactly who the character is. You know, what do you, how close are you? She is obviously closer than Noel is. And maybe, I mean, just think about it at a very, like, high schoolish level. You wouldn't write, she went to the store to get bread. Noel took the bread and went to the. I mean, that's the opposite. You need to say Noel went to the store and get bread while she was there. She went up. To, I mean, you tend you tend to get close. You tend to telescope in. But there are moments in a paragraph where you step back. And there's no rule for this. Obviously, if, if there were rules, then we then I'd be rich. Um, but I, so I think you, me, you proceed intuitively. But I do think that. The issue of summarized versus actual dialogue <coughs> is an issue that grapples very directly with this question of how close you are. And I can give you an example from this, uh, a story I teach um, by Ethan Kanan um, called The Year of Getting to Know Us. From his first book of stories, Emperor of the Air, I think it's the very strong, among his strongest work, and I think it's the best story in the book. So it's the opening scene of the story, and the it's a told from the perspective, perspective, first person perspective of a son, adult son, who's in the hospital room with his father, who's had a heart attack, and the son and the father have had a somewhat difficult relationship, quite difficult relationship over the years, and it's the kind of an emotionally hamstrung son and an emotionally hamstrung father. I think I'll get the opening more or less right, but you have to give me a little poetic license. So it starts like this. It starts like this in summarized dialogue. I told my father not to worry that love is what matters, and that in the end, when he is loosed from his body, he, he should know he did all right by me, his son. Paragraph break, new paragraph, and he said, open quote, don't talk about things you know nothing about, end quote. And if you actually, when you read it, it's a startling moment, 
and especially when it's read aloud, people tend to laugh, although it's not at all funny. But the, the reason people laugh is because there's something very jarring about going from this kind of highfalutin, formal language of summarized dialogue to actual dialogue. And it's that contrast that startles people and makes the feeling of don't talk about things you know nothing about feel much more like a knife going into the stomach. Now, Ethan Kanan did not sit there and say, how can I make it feel like a knife turning into the... You, know, I mean, you don't think about that in the first draft. But what you do is you intuitively do it, and then you read it, and you think it's all wrong. So you, it's all trial and error. But when you get it right, you recognize it's right, and it's right for the reasons that I'm, that I'm talking about. And so I think people think that dialogue is about voice, but actually dialogue is, very, is not really about voice at all. Narration is about voice. I mean, dialogue is just to, you know, you're, people actually talking. Whereas voice is, I mean, I told my father not to worry that love is what matters, and in the end, when he's loose from his body, he should know he did all right by me, his son. I mean, try to put that in actual dialogue. It's preposterous. I mean, from any character. And so I, I think of, of narration and of summarized dialogue as being a chance to use voice. So all that is a very long-winded way of saying that yes, it's something I think about a lot. <laughs> but I'm not thinking about it consciously as I'm doing it. It's like Roger Federer. I mean, I mean, it's, well, it's like Dave Foster Wallace. I'm not comparing myself to Roger Federer. But it's like what Dave Foster Wallace is talking about when he when he talks about Roger, Roger Federer. What we talk about when we talk about Roger Federer. Um, <laughs> that basically, um, he's saying that you know you do it intuitively, but then when you recognize it, it's right. And I think that's what a writing workshop is about. It's about being a really careful. I mean, I don't think you teach someone how to write. I'm a big believer in writing workshops. If I did, I wouldn't be holding the job that I hold. But I don't think you can turn anyone into Faulkner, but I think you can teach people to become better readers. And if, you become, if you're a better reader, you become a better writer. You learn how to get out of the way of your mistakes. So you learn to appreciate what works in other people's fiction and what doesn't work in other people's, people's fiction, and you're able, as best you can, to imitate and replicate that in your own work. So that's my long answer. <laughs> People are, people are afraid I'm going to give it away. <laughs> but can you talk about Mr. Chesterfield and show, don't tell in matrimony? Yeah. So what Marianne is referring to is um, early in matrimony. So Julian wants to be a writer, and um, now you're really testing me because I haven't thought about this stuff in years. This is the first time I've read from matrimony in you know, three, four years. Um, so uh, Julian has a, a professor named Professor Chesterfield, um, who is you know had one book that made him very famous thirty years ago, and he's had this <coughs> thirty-year writer's block since then, and he's sort of a cult figure on campus, but no one really knows him any longer, and he gets more and more curmudgeonly as he um, as he ages and as he continues to fail, um, and he's both very smart and kind of inspiring to Julian, but also an asshole basically, and he. Um, he comes to class pretty unprepared, but he has some insights. And he has Chesterfield's commandments, where if I remember, I think he's should be got 117 commandments <laughs> that he writes on the board. Maybe I can find, because they're in big print. I can find a few of them. Yeah, they're all in big print. Thou shalt not use the word kerplunk in your short stories. It's just a reference to like undergraduates, you know. Well, fiction is not sound effects. You know, there's too much. This relates to dialogue. And dialogue is about, about character. I, uh, you never want, you know, to hear a phone machine in a story, unless it's saying something particularly clever. But we know phone machines never say anything clever because everyone's trying to be clever on that. So in other words, you, you don't want to hear someone saying, "Hi, this is Sally. Please leave a message." I mean, that doesn't tell you anything about character. It's just reality for reality's sake. And this is a problem with the influence that movies and TV have on us. And I, I like, well, I like many movies and much TV, um, but they are not good at doing things that books do. I mean, books, I mean, the prob movies need voiceovers as, as a way of substituting for narration, and voiceovers almost always feel contrived in movies, whereas in fiction, you can actually say what a character is thinking. So this actually gets to two of Chesterfield's commandments. So he's responding to someone writing kerplunk in their stories, which is like an exaggerated instance, but you laugh, I see this all the time. You just see like audio reality for reality's sake. We don't need reality for reality's sake. We need heightened reality. I mean, I have my own reality. We all have. I mean, if we just want reality, we can live our lives. So, and I, I write realist fiction. I'm not talking about writing fantastical fiction. I'm writing that it's about doing something different from simply replicating actuality. So then another one was, 
Thou shalt not utter the phrase show, don't tell when discussing one another's short stories. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I'd say most... Yeah, there are more of them, but they're too hard to explain. And, uh, go. But uh, I mean, they're very easy to explain if you read the book, but if, you know, without it, it feels like a boring lesson. Um, I'm a very different teacher from Professor Chesterfield, but I'd say most of what he says I think has a, a grain of truth in it. I mean, I think that the phrase show, don't tell, which is said in every workshop, or you know, certainly every undergraduate workshop, um, is, has a grain of truth, but it is to me the lazy teacher talking to the lady student, lazy student, or the lazy student talking to the lady, or the lazy student talking to each other. I mean, I'm not sure what it means. It, well, I, I, I sort of know what it means. I'm not, I'm not as dumb as all that. But um, I think what it means, and there, here's the truth, is that fiction is a dramatic art. And you need to make someone feel something. And you can't, simply saying she was happy is not itself a happy sentence. You know, the first workshop I was in as a student, a student, one of my classmates wrote in her story, an incredible feeling of happiness washed over her. And the teacher politely said about that sentence, well, first of all, get rid of that cliche, washed over. Um, and second of all, if in the course of an entire novel, you can evo evoke an incredible feeling of happiness. That's a significant accomplishment. But he did not say, and one should not draw the conclusion, that therefore you can't say someone feels happy. This, I mean, it, if Proust, I mean, I just don't, you can't tell what a character can feel or, or think. I mean, is the, are all we doing is describing couches? I mean, I, I do think, <laughs> you know, I think something much more Kafka is going on. I think it's, you know, if you simply describe a couch, you may be accused of being boring, but you won't be accused of being maudlin or cheesy. Whereas if you describe, try to describe loneliness, or misery, or love, then you could be accused of being maudlin or cheesy. And I think that many people are very, very afraid of being accused of that. And I think that, of course, you don't want sentimentality in your work. But you do want sentiment in your work. And I think in order to get sentiment, you need to risk sentimentality. I mean, go the Hallmark card route and then cut back. I see way too many stories where they're so subtle that I don't know what the hell's going on. I mean, they're <laughs> subtle to the point of obfuscation. And, you know, we're going to leave it up to the reader. And, you know, I don't want to bias the reader. I mean, I can't, I see this less among graduate students. But I can't, especially in places like Sarah Lawrence, where I used to teach both undergrads and grads. Now I'm just at Brooklyn doing grads. But especially the undergrads at Sarah Lawrence, I, mean, I can't tell you the number of times students say, well, I don't want to bias the reader. I mean, I guess I sort of understand that too. I mean, you, you can tell too much. But if you really don't want to bias the reader, then why don't you just hand in 20 blank pages? You know? <laughs> and don't, don't bias the reader at all. See, I'm a writer, and I believe in biasing the reader. I, mean, I, mean, I guess I feel like I want, and I, I'll say this to my grad students sometime. You know, we'll discuss the story, we'll discuss what's working, what's not working. And then at some point, I'll say, well, what did you want the reader to feel? And the writer will look at me like, huh? And then I think, huh? <laughs> I mean, what you, I mean you, you, a writer should always be able to have some answer to that question. I mean, I'm not saying it's a simple answer. I want them to feel happy or sad. But you're, you're trying to make the reader experience something emotionally. And to simply abdicate is preposterous, which is not to say that you can't tell too much. But I don't want to bias the reader as a kind of an all-purpose defense of anything is, I, I think is, is absurd. But I think this is all should be part of this same thing. Is that, you know, I mean, people know that typing is that, I mean, people, these days people are bored knowing how to type, but back when I was a kid, um, when I was in 11th, summer after 11th grade, my mom made me take a typing course at the Betty Owen School for Typing. <laughs> because I was gonna go to college in a couple of years and I needed to know how to type my papers. So I did that, and there was a typing sentence. I think it was, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dogs. And that is the typing sentence, because it has every letter of the alphabet in it. So it's a good typing sentence, but it's a bad fiction sentence. But I see way too many <laughs> fiction sentences that are essentially, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dogs. She sat down on the pale beige rumpled sofa. I feel like, wow, I can really see that sofa, I guess. <laughs> but who's this character who's so obsessed with sofas? But I do think that, that 
people are way too obsessed with sofas. And I think it is a defensive posture because you know, you will not be accused of being a Hallmark card if you just write about a sofa. But the stakes are very low there. So my feeling is, so anyhow, and, and I do think that the, the, um, the distinction between show and tell kind of breaks down. Like, because not, not to be like, I don't know, not to be something, but the only thing that a writer really is showing is, you know, marks on a page, right? I mean, you do see things in movies. But if you can't read, then the, the experience of looking at a book is a very different thing from if you can read, obviously. So I'm not sure what, so I mean, she was nervous, she bit her fingernails. I'm gonna give you two options. I suppose she was nervous as telling, because that's, I guess, describing an emotional state, and she bit her fingernail as showing, because that's showing her do a gesture. To me, the distinction is spurious. And if I had to choose, I guess I would choose she was nervous because she bit her fingernail. It's so, it's such a generic gesture of anxiety that it seems to me a cliche, where she was nervous, so it can't do a lot of work. I mean, it won't make me feel the anxiety, but sometimes you say she was nervous. I mean, you have to do it. Richard Bausch is extremely good at telling in a way that, I mean, look at his short stories. Um, he's extremely good at telling in a way that, and Alice Monroe, and of course, people like, I mean, People like Proust and Chekhov and Virginia Woolf, I mean, they would have no patience for this show, Don't Tell Things. So I mean, it's only true in the sense that you have to dramatize your scenes. They're taking place in real time. But not, excuse me, not everything is taking place in real time. And I actually, I see students who have too, too much summary or too little summary. Again, variety is the spice of life. I think it's helpful. Take your story and with a yellow highlighter, mark everything that can be filmed, right? Everything that, that can be filmed is material that, that takes place in real space and time, right? Dialogue or someone doing, or dialogue or action on Tuesday, say. Everything that cannot be filmed is either internal or just general description that is not rooted in time and space. So with your yellow highlighter, highlight everything that can be filmed. With your blue highlighter, well, choose your colors, you know, highlight everything that cannot be filmed. I think, you know, there's no, obviously there's no, Perfect. I mean, it depends on the writer, right? I mean, you know, Hemingway had a lot of dialogue, and the book had very little. But I think, in general, if you have, if you're all yellow or all blue, you probably have a problem in both cases of a different kind of problem. And I think, you know, storytelling is a combination of things that can be filmed and things that cannot be filmed. And much of what cannot be filmed is stuff that you're told, and how you're told. The land is very hard to do. Telling is harder than showing. That is the real reason people rely on show don't tell because showing is much easier. Just a photograph. I'm not, I'm not, nothing's easy, but telling is very hard to do, to do it well. What authors have inspired or influenced you? I mean, a lot, you know, I've, you sort of, the ones you like, you hope they influence you, and the ones you don't like, you hope they influence you in a different way. You don't want to write like them. Um, I feel like it's choosing among my children, and I, it's. I'll, I'll tell you some contemporary writers whose work I like a lot. I like Laurie Moore's work a lot. I like Charlie, Charles Baxter's stories. Um, I like. I'm not, since, since a lot of MFA students write stories, I'll say Andre Debussy, Andre Debussy Senior's stories. I think are, are tremendous. Um, uh, I'll give you some books that I've read recently that I've liked. I read a book this past year that has not gotten enough attention that I think is a really excellent book by a guy named Tom McNeil to be called, called To Be Sung Underwater. It's a really, really good novel with a totally hokey, improbable premise and some deep problems, but it almost doesn't matter because it's um, because there's things that are so amazing about it. The father-daughter relationship is really incredible. I like Charles D'Ambrosio's work. I mean, you know, I, I read widely and I think it's important to read widely and broadly, but I guess I'd say that if the world is divided between like the Cheever kind of writers and the DeLillo kind of writers, I think I'm a Cheever kind of writer. Um, I was very influenced by Tobias Wolff's memoir, This Boy's Life. I think it's a tremendous book. And I think it's tremendous in a very particular way, which is that it feels deeply not written. And that's not the only way to write. I mean, there are some people who write in a way that feels deeply written, and that's good. But for my work, 
to work. It needs to feel not written. Because for me, it's really about character. I think language is extremely important for conveying character, but I feel like the way I want to write is that I'm getting out of the way. And I want it to feel like the book is just there, and you don't notice me. Whereas, you know, something like David Foster Wallace, it's all about noticing him. And I think, you know, the things you notice are, are often very smart and interesting. Certainly, I mean, I love his nonfiction, more ambivalent about the fiction, but he was clearly a genius. But whether you like him or not, I mean, clearly, it's, it's not about David Foster Wallace getting out of the way. It's in some ways about his being in the way. I mean, you know, <laughs> he, he, he would have been the first to acknowledge that. So I do feel very influenced by writers who, and I think of Wolf as, as one, who uh, get out of the way. I mean, yeah, it, I mean, it, it does like make sense. It's, a tough, it's hard to answer. Particularly if your information, like this thing I'm working on, is at the very, very end, it's sort of like the aha thing that no one would get unless you knew that. The, you're, you're, working, you're working on a novel where, where there's an aha thing at the end? Correct. So my head has gotten stuck on one sort of framework, and I think the only way I'm sort of writing through that, but I keep questioning <coughs> You could talk a little bit about your decision. Yeah, it's very hard in part because, you know, I um, took me 10 years to write the book. Well, I think one of the hardest, I mean, I've had people say to me about this, this book and they read it in one sitting, and I, I think it's probably intended as a compliment. I find it. <laughs> I didn't write it in one sitting, I can assure you. And I think no one writes a book in one sitting, obviously. But I, th I do think it's a comic because I think that the book wants to feel as if it's been written in one sitting. And the further from <coughs> one sitting you are, the harder it is to do that. So if you write a book in one year, oh, a year is a long time to sit, but 10 years is 10 times as long to sit. So I think, I mean, I think one of the challenges when you write, a, just irrespective of what the book's about or what it's covering, it's how you make that voice feel consistent. Also, I was 33 when I started the book and 43 when I finished. So, you know, my concerns had changed. And so I think for any writer, the struggle with a novel, more so than a story, because a story you can write a draft of it in three weeks, it might take you a year to make it totally work, but you can see the whole. So, um, I don't feel like I'm answering your question, I'm just kind of spouting, but I guess I'd say is that with, with the new book, because it's a three-day book, I was able to have some conception of where I thought the book was going. I was wrong. I was deeply wrong, but having that wrong conception was a, a good guy. You know, sometimes, sometimes, having, sometimes you need to have directions, even if those directions are wrong, in order to get in the direction you want to. I think with a, a book that takes place over 20 years, especially the, the, the kind of book this is, it's very hard to have a direction. And maybe one way for you to have the direction, I haven't read your work, obviously, but one way for you to have the direction is that aha thing. Um, I, I shouldn't say this because I, 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 yeah. I say this not having read a word of your work, but having read a lot of people's students' work. I would caution you about making the aha thing be so much what the book is resting on. And, I, and this is total bullshit because I, I literally have not read a word. That's sort of why I feel free to say it. But I guess what I'm saying is that, because I think it does relate to what you're saying. You know, the reading experience, this is why, I mean, to my mind, a lot of mysteries aren't that interesting unless the characters are really strong. Because you get to the end and you get the answer. And you either figured it out, you feel like, oh, I figured it out. Or you didn't figure it out, you feel, oh, I didn't figure it out. <laughs> but I guess, that, you know, what I, I guess what I'm saying is that there's no... You, you cannot read <coughs> retrospectively. You certainly can't read retroactively. In other words, the reading experience takes place while you're reading. And so I have seen books where you see the author trying to make the plot hinge on, well, I'm not going to reveal this till I get to page 250. And I'm, obviously, you know, there are a lot of books that work. I mean, I think one of the hardest things a writer faces is what to reveal when. 
I had an undergraduate in Michigan years ago who started a story with, I was going to the bank when it happened. And we wait 17 pages to find out what it is. And so, yeah, the story didn't work, although he's actually a pretty good writer. But in fairness to him, I think he was trying to do what all writers try to do, is, you know, how do you draw that information? What do you tell when? Um, and I think it's one of the biggest struggles for a writer. And I guess I err on the side of not making, making secrets from the reader. Not secrets from the characters. I mean, that's very different. One character knows something, the other character doesn't know something. The secrets are really important in fiction. But I err on the side on not making secrets from the reader do too much work. Because I think the reader could often feel cheated. Why wasn't I told this? Oh, I wasn't told this because the writer didn't want me to know this because the writer wanted to write his or her plot. So again, that's just talking abstractly about it. In terms of matrimony, you know, because it took 10 years and I changed so much, it's hard to know what I was doing when, but I think a lot of what happened was the original conception of the book was I imagined a college reunion. I thought the book was taking place entirely at a college reunion. Well, there is a college reunion in the book, but it takes place 20 years and 275 pages into the book. So go for, I mean, I had no, no idea what the book was about. But in the final revision, I think um, what I ended up doing is so I, the earlier draft was really like college, particularly freshman year of college, and then the reunion 20 years later. And there was no center. And there was a lot of sort of like reaching back this way to try to bring information in. And so what I did in the final draft is I sort of went this kind of four-year jumps, kind of like presidential politics. Um, and I moved them around from place to place. So there, there's the Northington. Northington is basically loosely based on Northampton. So there's a Northington section and an Ann Arbor section, an Iowa City section, a New York section. So I used place and jumps in time to push the book forward. But I think that's probably incredibly unhelpful, but that's all I remember about what I did then. So, so I'm concerned about getting you back on the I, I'm actually, I mean, I, I'm fine. I mean, because okay. right. so, I'm happy to take a few more questions, but yeah. I said I don't want to keep you guys yeah, so, longer. So, I mean, I'll, it'll be a quick drive back. I want to make sure that the hot So why, well, why don't, why don't we um, move to the next phase, which would be books and um, and talking to you one on one as people okay. come and right. find this. Books and, this, uh, this yeah, this is absolutely wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you so much. <laughs>